Um, yeah, basically today what we're going to be doing is the assessment. So the brain map studies the electrical activity of the brain, basically evaluating five major brainwave frequencies ranging from slowest to fastest. We have delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. We can go into those in more depth at any point if you'd like. But today we're basically doing the assessment. Brain map is the assessment. And then the neurofeedback is a training tool that we can actually rewire the electrical activity of the brain after... Yeah, I mean, we could start it, I mean, immediately after we've collected data, oh, like then I'm, we could do it today. I mean, then, because then I'll know exactly like which areas of your brain might be overproducing, underproducing a certain wow. frequency, which connectivity between, you know, a couple different brain areas we might really want to train. So wow. the, the QEG, the brain map is really giving us the whole roadmap to your unique neurophysiology, which we then have the technology yeah. trained. You should, be, you should, <laughs> it's going to be exciting. It's going to be exciting. So we're going to start setting you up here. That's cool. All right. So this cap a little bit. This is the, the EMG cap that we're using. It's a 19 channel. Each of these white circles here is an electrode. So it's going to be measuring that activity a different location of his brain. And then there's a couple of ear clips that just serve as references while well, beyond that the ear loops. Alright, let's do it. Alright, Andres. But have you hold these couple guys? Um, yeah, perfect. I'm gonna just pull the rest of the cap over yet. So, Toby, how'd you get into uh, putting these caps on people's yeah. heads? Good question. I, I took a biopsychology class back in undergrad when I was at the University of Oregon, and we were really learning the, the biological basis of how the brain works on both like a chemical and electrical level. So people, much by I'm assuming your audience is probably a lot more familiar with the chemical side of things, you know, serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, these are all the popular chemicals that the brain uses to communicate with itself. Now, if we wanted to measure the chemicals in your brain, I'd have to set you up, uh, Andres, with a spinal tap, which might not be too fun. It's going to be a pretty invasive procedure, and so that's why it's a lot easier, more convenient, less invasive to study the electrical activity of your brain. But basically, you can think of it as two sides of the same coin. You have the, the chemical signaling and then the electrical signaling. They're both interrelated. Cool. Let's see right. Oh, if you wouldn't mind, just pass me that. Oh man, needles. <laughs> <laughs> Promise I'm not gonna poke him. We're just using this to actually insert the gel, the electro gel, which is like an electrolyte solution, which enables my amplifier to actually be able to record what's going on in Andres' brain. <laughs> And I'll start just by getting the ear clips here. You've those before, right? Heh. <laughs> you're, you're the first guy I, I, <laughs> kind of testing this new technology. It's pretty dangerous, you know, never I've ever seen before, but. Thanks for volunteering. Yeah. Now I've done at this point, definitely I'd say I should really like go back and try to measure how many of these I've done. It's probably been at least over a thousand at this point. Oh, wow. Uh, All right. So I'm starting to put some of the electro gel into each of the electrodes. I'm going to just be kind of wiggling it around. Yep. Feeling it. Right, yeah, I started, uh, started basically to continue that, that story. I, in that biopsychology class where I learned about this stuff, I got really interested in the fact that we could actually measure a lot of what's going on in the brain. 
and I found there were several research labs at my university that were utilizing this uh, basic technology that we're using today. So for about three years in undergrad, I was doing exactly what we're doing on you today in terms of setting up uh, and collecting the data and learning how to artifact the EEG recordings. And then, you know, I thought that was really, really interesting. I was very passionate about it, but kind of as I was finishing up in college, I was sort of left with like the, the pending question of, all right, so this is really cool. We're able to measure what the brain is doing, but can we actually do anything to modify and improve that electroplasticity? Right, like can you take action based off that data? Exactly. exactly. So I wanted to help people in the real world, people struggling with mental health, neurological conditions, along with people interested in using this for, for peak performance, you know, the wellness community and biohackers. So that's how I stumbled into the fields of neurofeedback and brain mapping. Wow. So that's basically the applied neuroscience, taking these tools out of the research labs and into clinics and real world applications. And, uh, you know, as far as, um, getting into the biohacking space, is it something that you anticipated from the beginning or did you want to stay within the, you know, uh, more of like the clinical space? Yeah, I know the biohacking space was definitely like a passion of mine, just even before I even started at the research lab, like back in high school, I started reading the Bulletproof blog. So if any like OG biohackers out there were reading that back like 2014, 2015, Dave Asprey started watching the podcast um, with Bulletproof and I got really interested in just anything I could do to like optimize my own brain performance. And then that sort of blended together really nicely now with optimizing and sort of hacking the brain. Well, I definitely, definitely was interested in that specific, um, that specific niche. Um, and I wanted to really bring these technologies that have, you know, they're, they're used not super frequently, but in most major metropolitan areas, you know, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, you'll, you'll find clinicians who are using neurofeedback and brain mapping at, you know, psychiatric or psychological clinics, but what's been really hasn't really been tapped into is bringing these technologies to the peak performance and wellness communities. So that's what I'm really passionate about doing. Definitely a, a huge, well, I don't want to say huge niche, but I mean, huge an opportunity of this small niche, right? Definitely so. Yeah. Cause I think, I mean, people, it's people know the importance of like working out their physical body, you know, and eating healthy proper nutrition and people are starting to play around with kind of more advanced things like cryotherapy and doing saunas. So really to me, I mean, obviously I'm biased being in the field, but I feel like kind of brain mapping is really the next kind of frontier of all this. Well, and I don't know how, how well you know me or how, how deep you've dug into my substance, but are you able to, uh, you know, with this technology detect if I have some kind of, uh, let's say, uh, deficiency in my brain or anything like that? Can you, can you diagnose me based off what you see? That's a great question. So the EEG or the brain map by itself is not a diagnostic tool. It's always important that I get a thorough history. So I should tell you of the slide. Okay. Exactly. Exactly. And if there's been any head injuries, that's always super important to know. Um, head injuries, I see a lot, even just very far, you know, in people's past, uh, those areas of the brain that were involved, those areas are concussions. Yeah. So there's a lot of applications in terms of like the athletic world, you know, former like NFL players, boxers, all these guys who have had repeated bouts to the head, you know, there's areas that really are not, not online. So that's a, uh, see something on the screen here. Is that my brain? This is, this is your brain right here. So, yeah. So it just it looks, looks busy. It looks busy. So that's because the, the signal is not great right now. So basically all of those, uh, all of those circles that we're seeing on the screen, the yellow and green and red dots, those are all the, basically the electrical signal that we have. So doing okay, but we need to get all of the red circles to be in the green or yellow range in order to get the record. 
A little bit. A little bit. <laughs> I'll try to be pretty minimal with the gel. No, dude, you can go to town with the gel. <laughs> Whatever it takes to get a solid six. I love it. Love your commitment to this. Let's do it. And um, so I'll tell you a little bit of, I'll give you some background. Um, you know, very early, early on in my life, I was diagnosed with ADD. Um, and I took medication for it for about a decade up until from the years of, you know, I was eight years old up to 18. And um, I definitely still struggle with AD today. You know, as far as my perception of time, I feel like I struggle a lot with perception of time and um, organizing myself around time. I feel like that's my biggest deficit. Um, someone recently on my team, I don't know if this was to kiss my ass or just an observation, but they said, Andres, look, we do get frustrated with you sometimes about making it on time to our team meetings, but Given what I've seen, I think that it's because you're so present in the things that you're doing that you put time aside, like you, that you, that you almost, the time is secondary, you know, like, you know, to, to sort of make this a little less abstract. Um, you know, if I'm podcasting, right, and I'm so into the podcast, into the material, if I'm in a flow state, I just completely lose perception of how much time has kind of, you know, gone. And so this guy was telling me, he's actually Roman on my team. So shout out to Roman. He was like, dude, you're so present with what you're doing that um, you kind of forget, you know, everything else. And that's a gift and a curse because, you know, obviously with the flow state, you can really put yourself in your work and, and, and give your best work and your best attention to what you're doing. But, you know, if you're disregarding time and other people are, you know, having to deal with you and get frustrated because of that, then it's not really uh, optimal. So I would say ADD is definitely a thing today. Um my lifestyle, I try and manage it, you know, with supplements, uh, good sleep, and always, you know, helps keep everything at bay, but um, definitely still prevalent in my life. Yeah. So would you say that something like you'd want to improve potentially being like your focus? Um, so I here's, I'll put it this way. I'm pretty good. Like once I'm focused, I'm extremely productive. It's tough for me to decide when I'm going to focus. I'll put it like that. Like it's, um, I really try to set up my environment so that I limit the amount of, uh, distractions, but on the contrary, in the opposite end, I find that sometimes when there are, let's say I'm in a coffee shop and there's other people doing their work. If I see other people engaged, then I'll become engaged, you know, but if I'm kind of just by myself, I have to really limit the distractions. So it's, I guess, overwhelming, the overwhelming, um, uh, and a general I I idea here is it's tough for me to choose when I'm going to be productive. Like if I plan it out on a schedule, yeah, like, okay, I, it makes sense to be productive and to work these hours, but I find that I have to work more so off of inspiration in the moment, like, which is cool because it kind of sort of keeps things flexible. But then if I have to absolutely do something at a certain point in time, it just, I, I find it difficult to find that focus. Does that make any, any sense? Yeah. As you can tell, I'm just kind of like beating myself up about trying to figure this out because it is something that's difficult for me. Um, but once I find it, bro, I'm in it and nothing can stop me. So if I can program myself to find that more consistently and if I have more control over finding that focus when I want it, that would be like golden. Yeah. yeah. Nice. You, think we, you think we can do that? Let's do it. Yeah, <laughs> right, cool. Absolutely. So if this, yeah, I just want to mention. So. All right, so we've got a good recording here. Uh, so, Andres, if you keep really still, um, so we're going to start off with, we're going to do a couple five-minute recordings, the first of which is going to be with your eyes open. So I'm going to have you just kind of pick a point sort of somewhere at eye level where you can sort of keep a soft gaze at. Um, and what's really important is to just really focus on relaxing all the muscles in your body really focusing on letting all the tension go in your forehead or jaw area. Yeah, we can move that a little bit back. Absolutely. And for the viewers here that you can see the computer here. So basically each, each of these lines um, is measuring the electrical activity, the brain waves um, coming from a different part of Andres's brain. So we're going to start the recording here. And we're going to do about five minutes, as I was saying, with eyes open. 
And also just try to limit your blinking as much as you can. Don't worry. Obviously, blinking is human. You can't eliminate blinking altogether, but the less... Um, well, the, the viewers can see it basically creates these huge fluctuations um, that's not real brainwave data. It's what's called artifacts. So it's just something that I have to edit out of the recording. Looks like some awesome clean data that we're getting so far. So you're doing great. You got about four minutes to go here. All right, you're doing awesome. We're about halfway through. All right, awesome. So we are at five minutes. So I'm going to stop the recording here. Yeah, <laughs> it's all good. This is definitely the most. Yeah, to really find that uh, smooth and steady focus and to keep from blinking, I just kind of had to had to zone out, but I feel like it was um, an investment in the rest of the show because, you know, setting all this up had me so crazy that there was like a little meditative state, I think, that I achieved. And I don't know if you can maybe see that here, but I felt like I was in like a, you know, just very peaceful, yeah. you know, felt good. Cool. Yeah. So now it's uh, eyes closed. Yeah, so now it's closed. eyes closed, so... All right, so whenever you're ready. Yeah. Is there, can I maybe sit down on the floor? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So whenever you're ready, Andres, you can go ahead and close your eyes. All right. So we're all done with the recording steer. Something really cool that both for you along with the audience, I think would be to show how some artifacts. So actually, are you able to see what's going on in the computer screen pretty well there? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to walk you through a couple of things. So, all right. So you're seeing, oh yeah. All right. So we're seeing the brain waves right now. Now, if you clench your jaw for me, you can see how all that is muscle tension, right? <laughs> so that is not real brain wa brainwave data. That's why the computer's marking it as red. That is muscle tension. That's what throws the recording off. Yes, I was going to ask you to do that next. You were already on top of it. So you can see how the blinking then throws everything off there. Now also try moving your eyes side to side. So we can see those fluctuations and also eyes up and down. Well, yeah, so different. Closed. I was trying to meditate. And one thing that I learned from uh, Patrick Porter, a PhD in psychology, and he's the founder of BrainTap Tech. I'm sure you are familiar. <laughs> yeah. 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 You, you had him on your podcast. Um, he taught me to put my eyes up towards the third eye, you know, to meditate and elicit a very calm state. So I don't know if that helped here or if it uh, influenced the data in a negative way, considering that it could be, that it could come up as an artifact. What do you think? It's a good question. Um, you know, if you're, if your eyes are closed and you're just pointing your eyes up, I would not see. Oh, really? Oh, okay, cool. Okay, yeah. sweet. Yeah, I would have let you know if, if we were getting that because I would have needed to construct you to alter something. Okay, cool. But yeah. Okay, so basically what I'm going to do now is do some edits of the data. My friends, I think it's fair to say we went balls deep <laughs> on this one with Toby making it happen here and having a really good time. This uh, episode should be live uh, next week, so stay tuned. And it'll be on YouTube as well. Uh, full video will be on YouTube, so stay tuned for that. Oh, sorry. So the thing actually, maybe if I am like editing this. Like yeah, and you can, I can get this. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's do that. And what I'll do as well. So the uh, full version of this will be on YouTube, but um, I'll have the uh, podcast editing team just kind of cut out, you know, the five minute sections and such and the editing process so that it's, you know, it's 
concise as possible with uh for the for those who are tuning in with just the audio. Let me know when you want me to capture with the camera. Yeah, I'll definitely let you know. I'm just renaming some files right now, so not the not the sexiest job this I'm working on. It's a cool laptop, by the way. Thank you. It's a gaming laptop. That no way. Everyone in the brain mapping room. Oh, but you don't play games on it? I don't play games. Oh, I play brain games on it. I don't <laughs> play brain games. <laughs> Fair enough. That's <laughs> cool. Awesome. Where's my other dog? Do you know? I think she's probably on her little bed thing over there. What do you think? She's in a theta state over there? <laughs> theta or delta? Yeah. It looks like... Delta. <laughs> Look at her eyes. Uh, delta state right there, huh? Yeah. She's knocked out. An interesting thing about brainwaves is and related to animals is like with cats, when they're just like in their like their zone just purring and they've got that calm kind of their eyes are just like very much look like a, a zen monk yeah. or something right that's like uh, a low beta like a sensory motor rhythm really yeah. wow and what about when they're knocking shit over i don't know what's going on <laughs> in their brain <laughs> alpha <a> state <laughs> something a lot different <laughs> Dude, I'm excited to try out that uh, that helmet, yes. the red infrared yeah. helmet. We'll actually be able to put you on a specific frequency that can be most suited for your unique brain activity based on the recording. So basically everything that I do in terms of the actual brain training is all guided based on the, this initial brain map. You know, um, for some people, they might have deficiencies of a brainwave, say beta, Beta is one that's really important for your focus and concentration, but also um, it can be involved in anxiety, insomnia, worry, just ruminating thoughts. So if you have deficiencies in beta, you oftentimes struggle with focus, concentration, a lot of ADHD, but people who have excesses of beta will oftentimes have like anxiety, PTSD, um, a lot of so, sort of nervous system over arousal issues. So that's why it's so important that I do the brain map because for one person, they might do really well on a protocol that entrains beta brain waves, say if they're deficient. Whereas if that person's overactive in beta and then I give them a protocol to enhance beta, it could potentially actually make their symptoms worse. And, and let me ask you this, as far as, um, you know, helping someone achieve their optimal brain health, does that mean that you're steering them towards a balance between these brainwave states or an improved ability to... Uh, elicit a brainwave state or is it completely unique to them and their you know neurophysiology like are you guiding them towards something that you know is objectively good or is it specifically suited for one that's a great question yeah so we have we know we might see certain uh abnormalities that are you know potentially someone has way too little or way too much of a brainwave um and that could be implicated in a variety of different conditions or experiences that someone's going through. But really, it's all about pairing the person's experience, their experience of the world, um, what sort of things they're struggling with, what sort of things that they're wanting to improve, pairing that with the neurophysiological data to get them on like the best protocol suited for their brain and what they're hoping to be able to achieve. Right. I can't, this isn't a mind reading tool. Well, I mean, in a sense, but I can't you know, tell exactly everything about someone through a brain map. It's about pairing together the data with someone's subjective experiences right. in order to kind of create the best protocol for them. And if you, let's say you help me optimize my beta function um, or my ability to elicit a beta state, let's is, say, that is that going to take away from performance in any other area? Like, you know, going back to what I mentioned earlier, I was, I was describing what my struggles are as someone that has ADD, right? My perception mm -hmm. of time, finding focus. Um, but I noticed that when I do find that focus, dude, it's like unmatched. Like I can accomplish weeks worth of work in a couple of hours. So is it going to take away from that ability or is it going to mm -hmm. improve my general ability to tackle, uh, you know, my work and, and to choose when I get to focus? So... 
I think you actually kind of hit the nail on the head with a comment that you made uh, a second ago that I wanted to touch on, which is sort of the brain's ability to oscillate between these different brainwave states is super important. Yeah. yeah. So when you're needing to focus, when you're needing to be really zoned in on a task, you want to be able to be producing uh, a lot of good beta brain waves in certain areas of the brain, particularly like the prefrontal frontal cortex, where a lot of your thinking, decision-making, all of that, all of those functions are taking place. You want to be able to produce a lot of beta brain waves. There isn't a brain wave that's bad. There's not a brain wave that's good. Yeah. It's all about being able to produce sufficient quantities in whatever state that you're wanting to be in. Okay. So when people are getting into meditative states, you don't want to be producing a ton of beta brain waves. Meditation usually sinks the brain into the slower brain waves of maybe beginner. Maybe uh, delta. Yeah. Well, uh, a, a super advanced, like maybe like a uh, someone who's been meditating hours a day for years could eventually be able to like meditate and get into a delta state. That's super yeah, difficult to access. State, right? Typically, a deep sleep, completely unconscious state. Now, there are some like advanced like Tibetan meditators, monks who have been doing this that can actually show based on these brain scans that they're able to access like waking delta, which is super fascinating observation. But for the majority of people, like a beginner meditator, even when you close your eyes, um, you'll start producing more alpha brain waves. So uh, you don't need to be producing as much beta when you're not as vigilantly tuned into the outside world. And then you sink deeper into meditation, you start producing more theta. Now, that's great when you're meditating, but if you're trying to focus and your brain's producing a lot of alpha and theta brain waves, you're not going to be able to focus. You're going to be uh, lost in brain fog um, and be kind of forgetting what it is that you're trying to do and your mind's not going to be super sharp. So when we enhance a certain brain wave or um, work on decreasing it, because that could be also part of the training. Yeah, that could also be part of the training if we see a certain brain wave that's super deficient, we might want to enhance it. If we see a brain wave that's being overproduced, we might want to inhibit it. Okay. And usually with, uh, with that, you know, with someone doing the training, um, they're able to then have a healthier balance of all of the different rhythms. So, so in that case, for example, to sort of bridge the gap in, in, in what we're saying, it's like, if I'm trying to elicit a specific brainwave state, but there is too much activity of one but another state, that's when you do the training. Because exactly. you may have a lot of activity in one state that can certainly be, you know, aiding you. It's what's it's like the background noise. It's getting rid of the background noise and optimizing uh respective deficiencies if there's a state that you want to elicit. So it's again going back to, you know, your subjective goals, um, they're certainly considered when you diagnose and 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 make these kinds of decisions as far as what training will look like. Exactly. So it's not about just helping everybody get to like the same balance or ability. It, it really is a subjective experience and training. Yeah, I, I would say it's sort of a combination of, of both. Like, like we want to see a nice, healthy balance of the different brain waves. Um, we don't want to see your brain drastically underproducing or overproducing a brain wave. So we're able to kind of evaluate with you know, respect to the reference database, whether compared to kind of the average statistically healthy controls, if your brain's producing way larger amounts or way smaller amounts of a different rhythm. But we're also able to see in respect to your unique or to your own brain, uh, something called relative power. So basically you can think of relative power as like basically a pizza divided in five slices. And we're wanting to basically measure how large is each slice each of those five slices in this analogy being a different brain wave. Right. So how much neural resources is your brain devoting to creating theta or creating alpha to creating beta? Mm -hmm. Ideally, we want a nice balance where your brain is devoting optimal resources to each because you want to be able to fluctuate in and out of different states whenever it's most useful. And as far as um, the training, can you pair that with you know supplementation protocols, lifestyle change? I would be upset if someone did not pair it with that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I definitely do coaching um, with people, with clients. I also recommend oftentimes like people work with, you know, other individuals if they have a lot of nutritional imbalances, if 
you know, they have gut issues. Chronic inflammation um, throughout the body is going to really affect the brain and actually really limit the rate of neurogenesis and neuroplasticity, the brain's ability to con uh, create new connections and form new pathways. And therefore to learn, you know, to elicit a state, to improve the ability to elicit a state, or perhaps you could be responsible for a deficit in this state as well. Precisely. And then it's the training's not going to work as well if there's all this inflammation because basically with the training, you're basically harnessing the brain's neuroplasticity. You're asking the brain to basically learn new ways of firing on an electrical level. And the more inflammation that's going on, the less the brain is capable of learning new ways of functioning. So it's it's super, super important. I never claim that like one of these technologies, neurofeedback or the photobiomodulation, which we'll talk about, um, these tools are all super powerful, but they're never, it's never sort of the panacea of like, oh, this is gonna fix everything. It's, it's a tool in your tool belt, just like diet, just like sleep, just like exercise. I know a lot of the things that you talk about. So I think that's there, there's, there's a ton of synergy for people who are already kind of digging deep in, yeah. in terms of knowing their physiology. Yeah, I think it, it's definitely just an, another layer of this health and wellness optimization process. Um, having the neurofeedback and the brain mapping and um, being able to pair that with the right changes, you know, to so that it really works synergistically. Because I, I mean, what is let's say unique to you, your experience, your knowledge, your expertise. What do you prescribe to improve, uh, you know, the brain's health and fitness? Mm -hmm. Because I, you know, it, absolutely, you, you you do offer coaching in in, in uh, uh, let's say holistic style coaching, more complete health coaching, and mm -hmm. and I'm sure you collaborate with other specialists in exactly. the field, but. Um, as far as your unique knowledge expertise, what do you prescribe for someone who wants to improve the brain health of it? Yeah. So, I mean, I, you know, you touched on, you know, the different kind of, I talk about the different fundamentals of sleep and exercise and nutrition, but in terms of someone who's really wanting to dial in on their brain health, um, that is where I employ a variety of other neurotechnologies. So as we sort of open the podcast with talking about how the, the brain map is an assessment of your brain's activity. We're not actually asking your brain to change its firing in any way. Yeah. Now, after we've recorded the brain map and have that data and we know which brain waves we might want to modify and what areas of the brain we want to do that in, we have an assortment of fun technologies at our disposal. Games. So games, yes, brain games. So the most popular of which being the neurofeedback. So basically right. um, how that looks is that someone has, you're not going to have a full electro cap on, but you have kind of individual electrodes at specific areas of the brain that we're really targeting. And then you'd be basically just with my system, you'd be watching Netflix. You get to just watch some kind of media. doesn't matter what. And <laughs> yeah, it's not bad at all. So you're getting audio and visual feedback. So how that looks is say for you, say if, if we're really wanting to enhance your ability to focus and we really want to train beta brain waves or a specific sub type of beta in a specific area of your brain, we have the electrodes on and we're, we're going to reward your brain whenever it creates more beta brain waves. Oh, no way. Yes. And now how that reward looks is the screen gets clearer and the audio gets louder when your brain creates more beta. Dude, get out of here. Yes. Get and this is in real time, the real time. Like within a hundred milliseconds, it's give it, it's recording and then giving your brain feedback. So when your brain deviates from that beta activity, say you start mind wandering, you get into a daydreamy alpha theta state, you're going to lose the reward. The screen's classical conditioning, class brain wave state, dude, you got that. That's exactly it right there. He hit the nail on the head. Well, even my, my dogs have their mouth watering. <laughs> Have love. Yes. Yeah. All that. Yep. Yep. Hey, so that's one of the technologies that, that we can work with. Um, uh, another one that we're going to kind of show showcase in a little bit is the photobiomodulation. So this is near infrared light therapy and also yeah. to just highlight. So with any like problem or, or that we do see, that doesn't mean any, like, obviously you're a very high performing guy. This is basically a good thing if we see things that we could actually improve. Yeah, if we saw like in, in the, in the 
uh, recording, uh, white is like normal healthy activity. If we saw all white, I would tell you, Andres, you got a you got a perfect brain. I don't know what to do with you. Like now, that very rarely ever happens. Yeah. Um, actually, I've never seen that before. Everyone has their unique neurophysiology. Yeah, I'm but, uh, seeing I'm seeing a lot of not white. <laughs> yeah. So there's so we're basically just totally in pool with uh, folks. So this, this out. Yeah. So this is basically an absolute power. So this is basically measuring Andres's brain compared to a normative database of people who aren't taking any medications, who haven't, or psychiatric medications, who haven't been diagnosed with any certain disorder, as much of a controlled normative database as you can get. Obviously, that's kind of difficult because what is a quote-unquote normal brain, right? Yeah. That's one of the limitations for sure. But Again, I know that a lot of, you know, who I am and how I am, it's a gift and a curse, mm -hmm. some of it. So... So I'm, I'm curious to see what you'll find and how we can improve my deficits mm -hmm. why, without taking away from the ability. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's absolutely something I see in a lot of high performers is very interesting, unique brainwave signatures. Yeah. I see this one here is like all red. Yes. Yeah. Yes. What's, what's yeah. Cells, a subband of beta. So beta. No way. Yeah. Yeah. Dude. Shoot. Beta, this is 16 to 20 hertz right here. Your brain's kicking out a lot of beta pretty globally. Um, so we're seeing all this excessive production, uh, most notably of this 16 to 20 hertz beta. Wait, but this, this, does that mean that, because um, we were talking about how that could help with focus and productivity. And, so does this mean that, in fact, there is a deficit in that ability or no, or the opposite? Not necessarily. It's your brain is working very hard in those areas. Oh, so, so maybe it's trying to compensate. It could be. Yeah, it could be. Oh, no way. But then there's something else physiologically that could be inhibiting it. So it needs to... Yeah, so basically that the power of these brain waves is very strong. So um, your brain may be just devoting a lot of its resources to producing these beta brain waves. If you were someone, you know, if, if you were telling me, look, I, I can't sleep and I'm worried all the time and I'm really crippled by you know, anxiety and I saw a lot of excessive beta brain waves, that would be a pretty typical signature of someone dealing with, you know, kind of a nervous system type of arouse. Now, this is a perfect kind of example of like why it's so important to talk with the client to like ask what is actually going on with their brain right? Um, and their, you know, goals. Because, you know, for you, you didn't mention, you know, dealing with any of those things. So this, um, you know, this could potentially be related to, you know, ADHD to the, the focus. So this isn't necessarily a classic ADHD uh, looking uh, signature. Oftentimes, we'll see excess amounts of theta, and we do see that um, in some areas, particularly the left prefrontal area right here where it says F7. Um, so your, if we can decrease this production, this overproduction of theta in the frontal lobes, we should absolutely be able to improve your ability to focus. Well, so alpha is looking really good. You're looking completely like normal, healthy activity in alpha. Gamma is looking great too. What is gamma responsible for? Yeah, so gamma is a really interesting worm that speeds signal processing in the brain. It helps different areas of the brain communicate with one another. Oh wow, that's, like, that's a good side. Yeah, that's <laughs> actually, uh, I don't know if you're uh, a big meditator, but gamma is actually one that, uh, gamma power and coherence is actually greatly increased in long-term meditators. So but, I... I'll, I'll put it this way. I used to have a very dedicated meditation routine. And what I found today is that I'm able to take away a lot of the concepts that I learned through a dedicated practice and I can implement them in my day to day. And so, dude, right now I can say I'm meditating, you know, like I find that I'm in a meditative state with most of the stuff that I do. Um, so that's how I get away with it. But I feel this like itch to get back into the dedicated sessions because they have other benefits that I really seem to enjoy. And, um, it's especially when it comes to like creative writing uh, uh, for content creation, I find that it's really helpful. So, and we can actually with the helmet, I actually wanted to entrain your brain to a, a, a gamma brainwave pattern. Really? Okay. So it'll actually do forty hertz. So it's saying gamma here is measuring between thirty-five to forty-five hertz. Mm -hmm. So we can actually put the light directly at forty hertz, pulsing forty cycles per second, and your brain will entrain to that, and you'll be able to yeah. get see some of those benefits. So now if we look, so that this was an absolute power. So comparing your brain to the normative database. Now this is the relative power that I'm going to show you 
which is basically comparing your brain to itself. That pizza pie analogy that I gave right. here, where these five brain waves are all um, slices of the pie, and we're trying to see how much sort of neural resources is your brain devoting to producing each of these brain waves. So it's clear your brain is devoting a lot of resources to producing all unbelievable. Things. Yeah. Um, so actually, even though in terms of the compared to the normative database, your alpha was completely normal um, for your own brain, it actually might be good to, to enhance alpha a little bit because we're seeing kind of blow pretty globally throughout the frontals, the temporals, the parietal lobes. We're seeing kind of mild to moderate deficiencies in alpha. So that might be something uh, that could be really good for you in terms of just aiding in relaxation, getting into that zone, that focus, kind of peak performance state, uh, enhancing alpha, and then actually also enhancing gamma. So that's when, when we look at the relative power uh, that we're seeing deficiency in. So that's why it's so important to both look at the absolute along with the relative power. Right. Um, because this is comparing your brain to itself. So your brain is spending all of this energy, these neural resources, creating a lot of beta. And but could that have been, because when I was, you know, sitting there with my eyes open, closed, um, I guess my intention there was to try and relax as much as possible mm -hmm. in order to keep there, to keep there from being, you know, um, any fragments and was it frag, fra Oh, artifacts. Artifacts, yeah. artifacts. Yeah. Um, I was just trying to, you know, limit the blinking. And do you think, can any of this influence the data itself? Or is this like, just like, no matter what I'm doing, are you going to see similar patterns? Or is it specific to just kind of sitting there trying to, you know, relax? Yeah, that's a, a great question. If we're doing, so we like to just do like baseline recordings, having people like what you were doing, just kind of gazing off into the distance. If we had you say working on a math problem or reading, doing some focused task, your brainwave patterns would absolutely shift. Yeah. But but still you think you would see a similar a similar similar pattern. And and the replicability, like day to day, people oftentimes ask me that, like, you know, if I'm to go out drinking tonight, is my brain oh my activity gonna be different? So it, it will somewhat. So, you know, maybe to the degree that that person drinks. Um or you know how much caffeine they're consuming in a day. That is definitely gonna produce some changes, but they've shown like about like 97, 98% replicability of this data. Oh my so God. if we were to do this brain map today with you, and then I came back and scanned you again next week, statistic, statistics would say 97 to 98% would be the same. So it's a pretty good scientific measure wow. of your brain's performance.